Hi, um, I'm Yan Sop Lee. I'm another RISC-V instigator. Um, before I start to talk, I'd like to do one, um, talk about one administrative thing. So if you are talking at this workshop or boot camp, please send me your slides to this email so that I can put it um, on, on the workshops tutorial and workshop page. So um, today I'm going to talk about our status of our current RISC-V rocket chip SOC generator written in Chisel and some about the future plans. Um, I typically don't try to start out to talk by apologizing to people, but as I was writing this um, th this talk, I just realized like we just put out a blurb of source code out there without any diagrams. I really apologize for people who had to reverse engineer all of our code. So hopefully the talk today that I'm giving will help you a little bit. So today's talk is about what is the rocket chip gener SOC generator and what, what is it generating. The how part on using the SOC generator is going to be done by Colin at tomorrow's boot camp over there. So the rocket chip SOC generator is a parameterized SOC generator written in Chisel. It generates some tiles, which currently puts down a rocket core and some private caches. It also generates the uncore, including the outer memory system, which includes a coherence agent, shared caches, DMA engines, and memory controllers. And it also glues all the pieces together. So um, let's look at some block diagrams. I'm going to show you lots of them today. This is what the rocket chip SOC generator generates logically. As I told you, it generates an arbitrary number of tiles, which consist of currently a rocket core with, with or without a floating point unit, a rock accelerator. Rock stands for rocket custom coprocessor. So you can instantiate your own favorite accelerator here. And you can generate also an L1 instruction cache and a non-blocking L1 data cache. And it also generates the HTIF block, which Andrew explained in his previous talk. The way to think about it in this SOC generator is that it's a host DMA engine, where the host can basically um, put in reads and writes to the target memory without any CPU intervention. And then it also generates the uncore, which includes the L1 crossbar and the coherence manager and, and some converters to convert the complicated memory I.O. to a more simpler memory I.O. Um, so um, I like to talk why, um, a little bit of our reasoning on why we write these SOC generators. Well, it really helps tune the design under different performance power and area constraints. And whenever you're trying to port your RTL to different technology nodes, it is really great to change your cache size and then you know number of pipeline stages. And sometimes maybe your even your microarchitecture for your different applications. So currently, the parameters include the number of cores, whether or not you're going to instantiate the floating point unit or vector units. You can change the cache sizes, associativity, the sets, you know, the number of TLB entries, and even the cache coherence protocol. And you can, of course, change the number, the number of floating point pipeline stages and the width, width of the op chip I.O. And there's much more. So um, why do we write it in Chisel? So what is Chisel? Chisel is a hardware description language developed at UC Berkeley. Chisel stands for Constructing Hardware in a Scala Embedded Language. So as the name suggests, it's embedded in the Scala language. And so it's Chisel. So the reason why you write generators in Chisel is because Scala is a very powerful language, and it makes hardware designers' life so much productive by relying on the modern software engineering things, such as object-oriented programming and functional programming. And that actually makes our lives so much easier to the to the extent that now the hardware designers at Berkeley probably would not write Verilog. They would say no to that. So what the what the, so what what does Chisel do? Chisel um, so once you write um, the generator in Chisel, it it has three backends. It has a C plus plus backend, an FPGA backend, and an ASIC backend. So you can you can um, you can generate C++ code and compile it and run it, and it will give you a cycle accurate software simulator, which is actually 10x faster than your VCS synopsis simulator. And more importantly, there's no license to actually go down this route. So, and uh, I like to also note that this software simulator can even generate a wave dump, which you can open with GTK Wave. So you can actually develop hardware um, and do RTL simulation with no license. 
And it can also generate an um, Verilog optimized for FPGA, and you can also map it onto an FPGA, and you can run um, longer jobs, such as um, in you know a billion cycles or even more range. So once um, you can debug your um, source code over here, and then once you're happy, you can move it down to the Ver ASIC Verilog, and you can use your standard ASIC tools to generate a GDS layout. Okay, I like to switch gears and talk a little bit of our rocket scaler processor. It's um, pretty vanilla as it is. It's a 64-bit five-stage single-issue in-order pipe. It's um, something that you would see in a in a textbook. It's you know PC gen, fetch, decode, execute, mem, and write back. Um, I like to point out some some interesting things about this rocket scaler core. We designed it um, very carefully to minimize the impact of long clock to queue output delays of compiler generated RAMs because that's probably what you'd get when you target a, 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 a um, technology process. So in, or, in order to mitigate this, we have moved the branch resolution to the memory stage. Um, so that actually increases your branch uh, resolution latency. But we mitigate that by uh, branch prediction. Um, we deploy a 64 entry BTB. Um, 256 entry branch history table and a two entry um, return address stack. And of course, since you know, we write generators, all of these numbers are tunable. Um, we also have a MMU that supports page-based virtual memory. All the instruction cache and data caches are virtually indexed physically tagged. Um, this rocket scalar core also supports um, an instantiation of a IEEE 754-2008 compliant FPU. It supports single precision, double precision FMA, fuse multiply adds with hardware support for some normals. Um, one thing to note here is that all the instructions, the rock instructions that go to the accelerator um, is committed and then sent to the rock accelerator. So um, the first question I always get after t talking about the RISC-V rocket core is, so how does it compare to a, an ARM Cortex-A5 core? Um, I know that Drystone is not the best um, benchmark you'd use, but that's what ARM gives you on the web page. So. so the Cortex-A5 is a 32-bit ARM v7 ISA. Um, it's a single issue in-order pipe. That's why we picked it. That's the most similar microarchitecture. Um, the performance one point is 1.57 DMIPS, and the rocket core is 1.72 DMIPS per megahertz. And actually, with Andrew's most recent GCC 4.9 port, um, the performance went up to 1.82 DMIPS per megahertz. I'm not telling you that we're that much better. Um, so in order to look at the power performance area, we map the rocket core down with the same TSMC 40G plus um, technology. So the area without caches, excluding the caches, it's about half the size. Um, so um, area efficiency wise, we're about 50% higher. Um, frequency, um, it's pretty arbitrary. Um, we can synthesize and place and route at higher than one gigahertz. Um, the power is about half um, half the power. But you know, more importantly, you don't need to believe my numbers. You can download the source code right now and you know go and try to synthesize and place it around with your favorite technology. So just to give you just I'm trying to you know give you some pers put you into per per perspective that you know we're kind of in the same ballpark. So um, going back to the HTIF um, block, it's a UC Berkeley specific block mainly used to emulate the devices for simple test chips. It emulates the system calls, console, block devices, frame buffers, and even network um, devices. So um, one thing to note here is that once you actually develop a real SOC with real devices, there's actually no reason to put down this HTIF block. So just keep that in mind. Um, as I said, consider it as it as a host DMA engine, and it's just a port for the host system to read and write the core control and status registers and the target memory. Great. Um, so one thing to understand to figure out what the rocket chip actually does is to understand the important interfaces. So I'm going to mainly talk about the interfaces now. So I picked five important interfaces in the rocket chip. The first one is the rock I.O., which is the connection between the rocket and the accelerator. The HTIF I.O. is the connection between the HTIF block and all tiles. I have emitted one HTIF I.O. connection here. Um, and 
There's one, uh, another very important um, interface is the Tylink I.O., which is our coherence fabric. So the backside of the instruction cache and the data cache will talk Tylink I.O., and it will get arbitrated out, and, be, and it will be connected to a coherence manager, which will keep all the ca private caches coherent. So I will talk a lot more about the Tylink I.O. in the next couple slides. And then finally, there's the MemIO, which is a simple Axie-like memory interface. So the backside of the coherence manager talks Tylink I.O., so we need to put a simple Tylink I.O. to MemIO converter at the end to terminate the memory connection to the outside world. Um, and also there's the host I.O., which is the host interface from the laptop to the HTF HTIF block. Um, th th it's not really important, I just wanted to put it out there. It's basically serializing the HTIF protocol over an arbitrary number of um, connection bits, and it's, we slow it down so that we can only use single-ended um, 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 single I.O. pads. Great. <clears throat> Let's talk about the most important interface in the rocket chip. It's the Tylink I.O. Um, to um, help you understand it, I have drawn two clients here, which both have caches. And it's talking to a manager which keeps all um, the, the system coherent. So the Tylink I.O. consists of five sub-bundles, which is acquire, probe, release, grant, and finish. So all of these interfaces are decoupled, meaning that they, all the interface it goes across a ready valid handshake so that you can put arbitrary queues. And since normally a client would be on a different voltage domain, you can also put async FIFOs in between um, um, uh, across the Tylink I.O. So now let's go through some examples. Let's think about it. Um, so let's assume that now a client, a cache, wants to read a cache line. So it needs to make sure that in the entire coherent system, there's no dirty copies of that cache line. So the client, and, and, and let's start out by thinking the manager has no state in it, meaning that it needs to snoop all the clients which participate in the cache coherence protocol. So the client will ask, um, will acquire that it will, I, I, I want to read a cache line, then the manager will send pro messages to all the clients that are participating in the cache coherence protocol. And the client, if it doesn't have that cache line, it will just say, I don't have it through the release interface. But if it has a stale, uh, have dirty, dirty data, then it, it, it needs to ship back the data, data through the release network. And then once the manager collects all the release messages, it will grant the client um, permission, and then the client will um, report back, uh, will send an acknowledgement through the finish network. The reason why we have this finish uh, message is so that you don't, there's no need for a guarantee of message ordering here. So now let's think about the store case where this cache needs to grab a line exclusive then you know it's similar, it says I want that cache line exclusive, then the pro messages will say drop, drop all the cache lines if you have. And then the manager will go ahead and click releases and it will grant the permission and it will expect the acknowledgement back. So of course now if you can think about a smarter co cache coherence scheme where the manager has some state in it, with, where it knows which client has which cache line. So you can of course put directory bits inside the manager. But I'm saying all the, all the Tylink I.O. is decoupled to all of that. So now you can think about some client which doesn't have a cache, something like a DMA engine. So in that case, there's nothing to be probed because there's no copy inside the client. So there's some um, a subclass called uncached Tylink I.O. which consists of acquire, grant, and finish. And there is, of course, a converter which changes your uh, which basically accepts an uncached Tylink I.O. And, and exports a Tylink I.O., which is basically just you know, replying to the probe release message. It's like, I don't have it. And those um, converters live in the Uncore library. OK, moving on to the MemIO. There's a master and there's a slave. Um, the master would issue some simple read-write commands. Um, and um, so starting with, there's the mem request command, and it's decoupled. I have just detailed one of the decoupled interfaces here. So there's a valid signal going left to the right, and there's the ready signal going from right to the left. And the transaction will only happen when it's ready and valid. 
So the memory request command consists of address of the cache line and a read write bit. The write, um, the true indicates that it's a write, and there's a tag. And in parallel, there is also a decoupled memdata interface, which is uh, consists of a 128-bit data payload for the stores. Um, so these two two things, the command and the data, are decoupled. So if there's a store uh, command sent to the slave, the slave will um, will assume that there will be four beats of data um, coming in, in 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 the future. And then there's a mem response decoupled interface where the load data goes back, and of course it's 128 bit data payload. And there's also a tag um, tag bit. I'm, I'm sorry, not the 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 tag part of the interface. Okay, moving to the Rock I/O. Um, so on the left there's a rocket processor, and on the right there's the accelerator. So as I told you before, um, once the rocket processor fetches a rock instruction, it will it will move all the way to the commit stage, and once it can commit, then it will push it to the rock accelerator through this decoupled command interface. It will give the rock um, inter uh, rock instruction, which is 32-bit, and inside the encoding of the rock uh, instruction, there is a bit indicating whether the rocket processor is waiting for w waiting for a response. So in that case, the rock accelerator needs to send the response to, through this decoupled interface, and. Um, of course, um, the, acceler the accelerator um, has a port to the memory, which goes through, th through this cache I.O., which is sending um, loads and stores to Rocket's L1 data cache. And um, there's a busy bit going from the accelerator to the Rocket, indicating that there's something going on in the accel accelerator, like a memory instruction. So. Um, we we the rock rocket the rock accelerator needs to correctly um, expose that so that rocket can correctly implement the fence instruction, and there's the inner request line here, and there's a supervisor bit from the um, the status register going to the accelerator, and there's also an exception bit going to the accelerator, indicating that there's some kind of exception in the rocket processor. So those three things are used for virtualization. If you want to um, handle all the all the all the virtualization stuff, you need to respond to all these correctly. And there's also an uncached tiling I/O coming, from, you know, from the accelerator to the rocket. You can use that to implement a DMA engine. Or um, in our vector unit, we use this port to actually um, hook up in a vector instruction cache. There's also the page table walker I.O. It's just in case you put in some TLBs in your accelerator. So these can, um, this port can actually walk the TLB structure. OK, um, moving to the HTIF I.O., which connects, has a connection from all the HTIF block to all the tiles. There's a reset signal going from the HTIF to the tile and the core ID indicating which, I, which um, core number the, the specific tile is supposed to be. Um, there's no technical reason why this is part of the HDFIO. It's rather historical. Um, and there's also the control register read write interface here. The HTIF can send a request to the tile, and the HTIF will be expecting the tile to respond through the CSR response interface. Um, another thing is that the tile also, the HDFIO um, holds the IPI request. Um, this is also n a nothing technical, it's rather historical because um, the HTIF has connections to all, t all tiles, so the HTIF will act as an IPI hub. So the tile can request and send an IPI to other cores through this interface, and the tile will expect the HTIF to respond that it did indeed send the, send the IPI to the other core. Um, one thing is, um, HTIF IO is likely to be modified in the near, near future as we walk towards a um, self-hosted system. All right, I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how the rocket chip is connected to the outside world. Let's start from the rocket chip C++ emulator setup, because it's the easiest. So this box here indicates all the block, uh, all the block um, rectangles that I just showed you. And um, there's two interfaces coming out of the rocket chip, is the host I.O. and the mem I.O. So the test environment needs to somehow support and support these two interfaces and ship bits in and out of these interfaces. So um, the RISC-V front end server will talk the host I.O. to the rocket chip. 
So um, as Andrew pointed out, this the front end server acts as a bootloader. So the front end server will write the target um, will write the program into the target memory through the host I/O, and it will trickle down to the mem I/O. And in the C++ emulator, the DRAM is simulated by DRAM Sim 2. It's a DRAM simulator that is open sourced. And the front end server, after writing um, all the code, it will um, let go of the reset of the core and it will start executing. And it will start pulling on the tethered registers to, um, to handle all the IOs. Moving to the FPGA setup. Um, so the rocket ship still needs um, host IO and mem IO connected to something. So um, the, uh, for the FPGA, we extensively use the um, Zinc FPGA, which has an ARM core, because that um, eases a lot of the um, development of the Ethernet IP and the memory, um, the memory IP. So we build a host IO to AXI converter, and we connect that bus to an AXI master port on the ARM core. And we build a MemIO to AXI high performance converter to convert the MemIO to an AXI high performance port and connect it to a slave port. And we run the front end server on the ARM processor on the Zinc. So um, going through the thought exercise again, the front end server running on the ARM core will download the program through this interface, which will come back out in this MemIO interface, we'll, which will talk the DDR3 protocol, I mean the interface to the DRAM. And that's how the, the entire system works. So um, let's talk about the UC Berkeley's test chip setup. I mean, of course, we would love to have a 120-bit wide interface coming out of the chip, but physics dictate actual um, what, what we can actually build. So we build a simple block here, which is the MIO serializer, which basically takes the MIO interface and it serializes it and it slows it down so that we can use, again, single-ended um, I.O. coming out of the chip. So in this case, the rocket chip is the actual silicon and everything else is hosted on the same zinc processor. So now we have slowed down and serialized the MEM.I.O. So this is a different, so I call this a proprietary front, front side bus. So then we instantiate so um, the, the opposite side of the serializer, the deserializer, to re recoup the MemIO interface. And then we basically leave everything else the same as the FPG um, setup. But of course, as I told you, this is not the ideal setup. So now let's go through a thought process on how we would build a rocket chip SOC setup. You would, you would terminate the MemIO to an LPDDR3 type memory controller, which will you know, have the LPDDR3 interface to the DRAM. And of course, you would have actual devices on the SOC. So you would hook up the interrupt lines, and you would make the devices talk the Tilink IO or the uncached Tilink IO, depending on what you want the device to do. If you want the device to hook into your cache current memory system, then you need to talk the Tilink IO. Does the device have some cache in it? Then you need to talk Tilink I.O. If not, you can just simply talk the uncached Tilink I.O. And for certain devices, if you don't care about it talking to the cache career memory system, you can simply just talk the mem I.O. directly to the memory controller. All right, um, now let's talk about who should use the rocket chip generator. So people who would like to develop a RISC-V SOC a variation of this um, thing, then you should look into the chisel parameters to tweak all the little things in the SOC generator to um, get something that matches your application. And so now people who want to develop a new accelerator, they should take a close look at the rock IO. They should drop in at the rock IO level. So people who want to build their own RISC V cores. Now there's there there's a chart where you whether or not you want to hook into the ca coherent memory system. If so, you should look into terminating your core at the Tilink I/O and plug it directly into the coherence manager. If you don't care anything about that, then you can terminate at the mem I/O and talk directly to the DRAM. So there's one thing that I want to point out because on the mailing list there was some traffic about why is your core too crappy when I map you know map it to an FPGA. Well, so I mean we didn't build the chip um, to map it on an FPGA. It was purely for verification purposes. So it had an HTIF block, which means that we needed a coherence manager. And it turns out all the data path used in the coherence managers manager wasn't really friendly 
um, to the FPGA mapping. So that's why it was kind of bloated. So um, if you're really worried about that, then maybe you, you know, for an FPGA for your embedded application, maybe you just need a processor, then you know, forget about Tilink IO. Just talk, you know, talk directly to the MemIO. Then you don't need the expensive coherence manager. And also, people who would like to develop their own device should drop in at the Tilink IO or the un uncached Tilink IO or the MemIO, depending on whether or not you want to talk to the cache current memory system. All right, now I'm gonna look forward. That was kind of the current state of our rocket chip SOC generator. I wanna talk about the new features that are forthcoming. As, um, so we're, we're, we have plans and we're actively working on building an L2 cache with directory bits for the shared um, L2 cache. So this is kind of the design sketched out. Um, it's a banked L2 cache. The way that you stripe the cache lines will be programmable, but let's think about the case where you just stripe um, uh, cache lines across the banks. Then this crossbar will know how to route the, route, route the memory request to the right L2 cache. And all the L2 caches will act as a coherence manager and we're, we are planning to build directory bits in. I mean, in other words, it's, it's a snoop filter. And as you can see, the backside of the caches are also gonna talk Tilink IO. That means that you can hierarchically compose these to build our level caches. For example, like an L3 cache or an L4 cache. And then at the end, you can terminate the Tilink IO with the MemIO and you're good to go. Another consideration is what if your rock accelerator has a lot of state and talking to the L1 data cache makes no sense, such as like a vector unit or a GPU. Maybe you don't want to talk directly to the L1 data cache. Maybe you want to talk directly to the bigger, bigger cache, which is the L2 cache. So we are actually actively refactoring the rocket chip generator so that the rock accelerator also has a tiling IO port here. So um, it will not talk to the, I mean, the path to the L1 data cache will remain, but you will have an option to talk to the outside world. And there are also new features on the deck. Um, Andrew is gonna work on a dual issue rocket core. Um, there's also the Huacha vector unit, which drops in at the rock IO level. Check out huacha.org for more um, details. And we're actually debating whether we should just dump MemIO and use Axie. I mean, MemIO looks more or less like Axie. Um, so these are the Berkeley test chips that we generated from the rocket chip generator. There's um, five tape outs done so far in the IBM 45 nanometer SOI process. And they are, there are four Raven chips coming out of the ST28 nanometer FDSOI. So I want like to present to you our latest and greatest chip. It's a three millimeter by six millimeter chip fabricated in 45 nanometer SOI. It consists more than 75 million transistors, which are used to implement a dual core RISC-V processor with vector accelerators that was instantiated by the rocket chip SOC generator. And there's also a megabyte SRAM memory structure and there's some um, circuit research um, using um, putting monolithically integrated silicon photon links in, in the same die too. So this chip runs at a nominal voltage of 0 0.9 volts and it's able to achieve higher than 1.5 gigahertz frequency. And it was able to run all the way down to 0 0.65 volts at 250 megahertz. The reason why I'm showing you this is that the output of the rocket chip SOC generator is not total crap. So this is kind of the feature list of all the chips. I mean, um, so I just want to point out a couple things. So uh, we've been working on this SOC generator starting from, I guess, two years ago from now. I guess more than that. So I mean, the point is that we've been constantly working on it, refactoring some interfaces here and there. And um, one of the chips that we built um, was able to hit 34.1 double precision gigaflops per watt uh, running matrix multiplication on the vector unit. I think that's pretty cool. All right, um, that's it of my presentation and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hi, how well does this map to the FPDA? I mean, the Alteras and Cytics in the world have spent a lot of time. What's your metric? Is it frequency or area? Either. I mean, it maps and it runs no. at about 50 megahertz right now. Right, so if I was to develop the same core in Verilog, 
I'm likely to get a better result because they map directly to the underlying architecture? Um, so when you say develop a new core, that means a lot of things. I mean, you could actually optimize, optimize the marker architecture so that it maps well to the FPGA. And I, I mean, if you do that, I think you would be able to hit more than 150 megahertz. And I mean, once the target is an FPGA, I would do things a little bit differently because now you can actually have devices on it. You can actually dump the HTIF. And, what, and actually, one of, the, one of the posters, we built a Ethernet device around the TMAC. So it has a DMA engine. It has DMA rings on it. And we actually wrote Linux drivers for it. So you can actually SSH into the FPGA. I mean, the RISC-V processor running on the FPGA. So I would, I'm not, I mean, I would go down a different route, but. Yeah, so this, the rocket microarchitecture is not designed for okay. FPGA target. We run it on the FPGA just for verification. So chisel, chisel, there's no overhead versus right. Verilog in using Chisel to map a design to the FPGA. You can write exactly the same thing in Yeah, just to make it chisel. really clear, yeah. Chisel is not an HLS. It's, you use Scala to lay down registers and muxes as, as you want. The designer will, you know, do it. Chisel will do exactly what the designer said to do. I just want to know more about uh, the functionality of your SOC generator. For example, if I want to generate what in this picture, mm -hmm. does it mean that you already have the layout data of the core of the L1 or characterized and you just call them? Or your SOC generator will generate something? Now? The SOC generator will give you Verilog. And hook, I mean, if you use the ASIC backend to okay. build a chip, it will generate Verilog and hooks to call your SRAM compiler. And once you get the Verilog, you need to do the floor plan yourself to, for your technology. At what level is the Verilog? At the transcate level? Or? Oh, no, it's, it's somewhat structural, but you know, all the, all, lots of things are still behavioral. Like for example, the adder would be just in, you know, an add function so in they, Verilog. Even the memory should have been there, right? The memory, as I told you, like um, the design, the SOC generator is written in a way that it just calls out memory, and it will generate a configuration file for all the memory structures that are used in the SOC generator. And there's a script that you need to fill in to actually instantiate your SRAM that you have. OK, that means the actual design is already done, the primitive. Right, I mean, right. you need to do the physical design. Okay, after you generate, if I, do I have a database to verify the performance? What is the database output? I mean, what kind of output before you get the layout or you get the layout? If I want to verify the layout work, do I, I have the data? I, I, guess, I guess the table that I showed you is kind of the database that we have so far. I mean... So the variable that comes out, you have to stitch together with the compiled macro blocks you get from the SRAM compiler, but it will spit out the configuration parameters you need to run the SRAM compiler to generate those blocks. So, um, and then you know, once you generate the blocks, you know what the, you know, the frequency or energy of those SRAM blocks will be. And then, you know, we typically run the whole thing together to, f to figure out what the power and cycle time will be of the whole design once we've generated all the pieces. But the chisel, we have to just basically call into the, whatever technology you have, the SRAM compilers for the technology. We just generate the parameter files to call those generators. Yes, um, my SRAM generator has a memory BIS in it. How do I get my BIS signals in and out of your chip? Ah, that's why we love Chisel, because the source code is orthogonal to all your BIS additions, because our BIS addition is just another Chisel compiler pass. You don't need to, you know, you know, make your source code dirty to get route all your BIS, you know, like connections out. So it's actually a compiler pass to actually, you know, it, it, it walks through all the chisel components and it calls out the memory blocks and you can write exactly what interfaces you want to route it out to the BIS controller. And that's actually really neat. And that's why it's more, you know, process independent. Right. I mean, be between the IBM and the ST technology, I mean, the SRAMs look different. So we had to route different signals out up to the top. Ah, this is Peter Shu, Oracle Labs. Um, your current um, TAL I.O. Um, coherent fabric that hooks up all the processor and the memory together, what kind of bandwidth are you able to do? And like, where is that going 
in terms of um, scalability in the future? Um, I will delegate that question to Henry Cook, who's actually the architect of the tiling IO. That's a complicated question. I mean, like be, while um, the mic is arriving there, I mean, like the ma the tiling IO protocol is orthogonal to what you can actually do in the manager to speed things up. But I'll let Henry talk more about it. Yeah, the the point of the the tiling is to kind of orthogonalize the design of the interconnect from the design of the various cache controllers and actually the like specific cache coherence protocol that's implemented on top of it. So uh, while you could look at the, the specific uh, measurements of what's generated right now, that actually depends on what you fill in in terms of the, the actual interconnection network. And so our existing chips, because they only have a dual core so far and maybe, maybe quad core soon, uh, really just have a, a cross, have crossbar crossbar networks, but you could look at doing you know we're looking at integrating with another project from Berkeley National Lab that's generating a, a system on chip uh, network fabric, and so you know Tilink is basically just th sort of the uh, you know similar to Axie is sort of the just the the I/O structure that lets you orthogonalize the design of the the coherence protocol from the uh, network implementation. Hi there. Um, I'm interested in the 10x speed up that you get when Chisel generates the C++ backend. Um, sure. I'm very skeptical about that. Ah, uh, I'll tell you exactly why we can do that. It's because we topologically sort all the combinational logic evaluation. We don't need, we don't do go through an event queue. Uh, so the question is, how do you model existing Verilog components? I'd like to point out that S you can SRAM is like like that, right? Because you you know you're kind of plopping down some library. So kind of what we I mean, Chisel Chisel has a feature to actually support Verilog black black boxes too. But another strategy is to actually instantiate the design and write like a script at the top level. I mean, that's you sh you're not supposed to do that, but that's oh yeah, sure. I mean, if you if you take a look at it, um, this part. I mean, it's terminated at MIO, and this all this block is Verilog. So, I mean, you kind of need a top-level Verilog block, which stitches everything together. But hopefully, you do that, you know, automatically with some script. So uh, you have. So it's all out, I think. Uh, yeah, we're we're oh, okay. recording. Okay. So yeah. thi this is so much integrated with that uh, rocket core, or what you have the accelerator. I mean, so. What levels of integration do you consider feasible on your SOC, essentially? Um, as I pointed out, actually, if you hook into the Tilink I.O., you can drop in your own core. And actually, um, the out-of-work processor that we're building actually just fits into the exact same socket. So it just you know works out. Can you go to the next slide? Sure. Next, after that, the orange one. There was, yeah. Oh, oh, the rocket, yeah, this one. So this rock accelerator is still integrated with the rocket core, right? It's a core processor. So there is no way that you can have a standalone accelerator that uh, is separate in programming. But no. I mean, who, who will push the work to the accelerator if the accelerator is not hooked up to any core? I would push it. Sh sure. So the whole point is, yeah, it's a great idea to have a standalone accelerator. It's a risk v core with a coprocessor. That's what it is. So that's just, that's what it is. This is your standalone accelerator. So, oh yeah, so you pay the burden of having that L1 data cache and rocket core. You don't cache. have to have one. It's a parameter. And also, if you don't want to do it there, you could do it as a device and hang it off as an I.O. device. It looks like a device that talks into the memory fabric. Okay. I have a question on the uh, verification environment. Is there uh, any verification sort of built for the block level or the interface level, or it, it's always in the chip level? Or? That's a great question. I mean, at least there are some verification stuff going on for the Tilink I.O. part, which Henry has built up. But I got to admit that other parts were only do end-to-end -end integration tests. I see. I, see. I mean, but. As you can see, this this interfaces are pretty composable. So, for example, like since this talks Tilink I/O, you really don't need anything else here. And you can, if you can make sure that some block which terminates Tilink I/O correctly, then you can save. I mean, 
not safely, but it, it will have a higher chance of working when you integrate all of that together. Right, I mean, what I'm saying is, if you have your you know, verification collateral talking terminating MemIO, you can basically emit the L2 cache and hook up the Tilink IO directly to the MemIO converter and just try to run your you know, regression tests there. Make sure that works before you compose this entire system with a more complicated outer memory system. So actually, I'm going to cut the question short a bit here because we have the whole boot camp tomorrow, which goes through you know how to do things with uh, this this thing. Um, so and again, we think breaks are the most important part of any meeting. So we don't want to, really. So we don't want to cut them short. Um, one thing I'll ask the people who, uh, the non-Berkeley folks who gave presentations and the people who are going to do poster previews, I'll ask if you'd like, if you can sign a release so we get allowed to use your um, image and slides and stuff so we can put it up on the website so people can see it. Just need a release from you for all the, both for the presenters and for the talk presenters and also for the people who are given poster previews. We need a release from you. Okay, thanks. <laughs>